there and welcome to Against All Odds. This week we're seaward bound, heading for the Isle of Arran, just off the west coast of Scotland. And today we'll be finding out the ways the weather can tip the odds when it comes to safety. Coming up... We'll hear from a group of young people who were swept out to sea from these very shores. We'll also hear a first-hand account of the devastation extreme weather can cause. And we'll be sailing the high seas when we spend the day pounding the waves on an RNLI lifeboat. But first, more about the people who keep our coastal waters safe. Now, this is Jeff. Jeff is in charge of launching the lifeboat at the Royal National Lifeboat Institute on Arran, or the RNLI for short. What does the RNLI do? We provide rescue cover um, nationwide over the whole of the UK and Ireland up to 50 miles offshore. How often do you get called out in a year? Nationwide, the calls are about 6,500 a year. Uh, on Aaron, we average something like 12 to 15 calls a year. Is there a right or a wrong way to behave when you get stuck out at sea? If you get caught at sea and you're in problems, then the best thing is to stay calm, stay with your boat, and if you see somebody in problems, then dial 999 and ask for the Coast Guard. Well, that's good advice because our reconstruction shows how the calm attitude of two brothers stopped a serious situation from becoming much, much worse. We've reconstructed their story in complete safety using the emergency services who helped us reenact exactly what happened that day. It was an ordinary summer's day on the island of Arran and the Earl family were being visited by their friends, the McDowells from Livingston. The sea was calm, so they decided to take their boat out. We were having a lovely family day out on the beach and we'd taken the boat down, had a barbecue, and we were playing in and out of the boat. The children were jumping out pretending to fall out of the boat. We were jumping in and we were helping them to learn to row. Sue and I sat down on the beach to watch them only 10, 15 feet away. They were playing in about three feet of water so they were very, as far as we were concerned, extremely safe. And we were keeping a close eye on them but in retrospect we were too far away. We should have been in the water with them and holding the line of the boat. Yes, that woman can Mums, Joe and Sue were happy enough when Robert, the oldest boy, was looking after the others. But they didn't realise he was about to get out of the boat to give the younger children a chance to row. And then suddenly I was aware that Robert had got out of the boat and was shouting at us. And at the same time I realised that there was a very strong wind that picked up and it was coming from behind an offshore wind. Got up ran to the water's edge, and was Andrew, Elsa, Robin and Craig in the boat, all trying to row, have a turn at rowing. The children's boat was flat-bottomed, and the wind that had suddenly blown up was skimming it away from the shore like a stone. And we kept trying to row back and row back, but suddenly the boat kept turning around, so we couldn't row back. And we quickly realised that they were going away, we couldn't get in there, and something needed to be done. Okay, I'll go to the post office. I'll go up the track. So I said, right, well, I'll make my way up to some local farm building, see if there's a phone there. And Robert ran off in the opposite direction. And I carried on okay, uh, talking to them, telling them to stay calm. I was even trying to give them instructions on how to, to row more effectively. I tried to row back, but my arm kept on aching. So I asked Robin to um, take over, and so she did, but she couldn't do any part. And she told me if she wanted to get back, um, she doesn't mind which part of the beach she gets onto, but she just wanted to get back. I looked out across the bay to the water, and you can't actually see the beach line because you just see the, the edge of the land. And the next thing I saw this little pimple floating out and realised that was our kids in this boat and they were going further out and yes, it was happening. Very quickly they were, they were out of shouting distance. The speed of it was incredible. I've never seen a, a boat move so fast without a motor. As Robert and Joan ran for help, 
the boat continued to drift further out. They were now more than a mile from the shore. I felt like really terrified of like how deep the water is. It was so, so black. I just couldn't believe it. All I could see was this tiny little speck on the horizon and I didn't know whether that was just the boat or whether it was an upturned boat or whether there were children in it or what. I had no idea. There was, there was nothing. I met, when I was running up, um, I met Bruce, the um, Craig and Robin's father, and I told him that I'm, I'm running to the post office to um, get some help. And it wasn't long before they were completely out of sight. You couldn't see them at all, and you just didn't know whether they were all in the boat. And the postman, when he picked me up, had said, do they know to stay in the boat? And I said, well, I, I don't know. We'll find out what happened to Andrew, Craig, Robin and Ailsa later on in the programme. Uh, but, Jeff, why did they get swept out so quickly? Well, they, they were on a flat bottom boat and uh, they went across the water like a squ uh, skimming stone. One in four of our call-outs nationwide involve young people and a substantial number of those involve rubber dinghies and lilos. How far out did they actually get? They went out about two miles, which doesn't look very far on the map, but is actually more than the length of 30 football pitches. And that was all down to the wind, was it? A sudden gust of wind that hit them and carried them away. Well, it was windy on that day, but the winds were nothing like the winds which hit our shores on the night of the 15th of October, 1987. The Met Office recorded wind speeds of 104 miles per hour, which can mean only one thing. A violent storm was hitting Britain. Fred Coombs, a firefighter, was on duty that weekend and was involved in saving people from one of the worst storms to ever hit Britain. This is his story. I've never witnessed a storm like it. It was about two o'clock in the morning that I was awoken by a severe gale outside. Although I was not on duty at the time because of the severity of the gale, I telephoned our control room in Maidstone to see if any assistance was required. Within five minutes of me actually telephoning our control room, a cross-channel ferry had broken away from her moorings and been blown across the bay onto the beach. She had snapped. 18 steel hawsers and 12 rope hawsers. Her engines were totally useless. On board were the, the crew, fortunately no p members of the public, uh, who we had to try and get off the ship. The Coast Guard calculated the height of the waves to be around 14 metres and the wind speed in excess of 110 miles an hour. While we were getting the crew off the ship, we noticed debris flying over the top of the cliffs above us and it was, I later found out that this was uh, remnants and parts of caravans from a caravan site above. The caravans were totally non-existent, they were almost to matchwood and being blown over the cliff top. From then onwards, the whole weekend was taken up with going to one incident after another for the whole three days from Friday morning to uh, Monday morning and the incidents we attended ranged from overturned vehicles on roads and motorways, trees crashing down on vehicles on A-class roads and minor roads, um, a block of flats in Dover, which was about five storeys high, they had all its windows pulled out, blown out. The amount of damage actually caused was quite horrendous. A storm of that intensity is only expected once every 200 years in Britain, so it's very unlikely you'll ever experience anything like that in your lifetime. Still to come on this week's programme. The second part of our reconstruction when we learn the fate of Robin, Craig, Ailsa and Andrew. Our top tips with advice on how to stay safe in the water. And keep watching because it could just help you with the answer to this week's competition. This is the RNLI lifeboat. It weighs 997 kilos, can reach speeds of 36 miles an hour. They're really expensive boats. They can cost up to 61,000 pounds to build. Last year, this one rescued 16 people. We're about to launch it into the Firth of Clyde. And luckily, it's not too rough today. Jeff, it's quite a small boat. Uh, what makes it special as a lifeboat? Uh, the hull itself is buoyant and it has a self-writing bag 
which sits on that frame there. So that makes it side. upright, doesn't and it? And that will bring it, if it capsizes, that will bring it up the right way. You are all volunteers. What happens if you get a call while you're at work? We just come down here. <laughs> understanding boss. We have very understanding employers. Well, to get an idea of what it's like to be a volunteer for the RNLI, we spent the day following Hazel. I've been in it now for five years. Um, what made me decide to join was my friend Yvonne. She kind of coaxed me into it and I thought, you know, oh, I've never done anything like that in my life. And I joined and I liked it and I thought, well, this is quite good fun, you know. So it's just something to put back into the community. Because you always get something out of it. Did a year's training and then eventually a couple of years training. Went down to Cowes in the Isle of Wight where they sort of have the inshore training centre and um, did the whole shoot and shebang down there, capsize, all the bits and pieces we get trained for basically. Um, and you, you pass that and get a certificate to see you're competent to go to see in one of their boats, you know. Hi, good morning gang, here we are again. What I want to cover this morning is to look at single operator CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And we'll use this only here. What we tend to do is go up to the patient and we give them a gentle shake of the shoulders and we speak to them. Hello. We now need to check to see if the patient's breathing. Here we go then. And we do 15 of these and it's quite fast, up to 100 if we can. One and two and three. Scenario is that a helicopter is, is reputed to have gone down, what we need to do is we have to actually work out exactly how long it's going to take the lifeboat to get from the Lamlash Boathouse station and uh, we need a course and so on and a time really for that. Right, now, you've, you've got it there, 20 you would, you would give yourself an extra hand Every second Sunday you know you do all the scenarios, you would do basic training, um, how to handle the boat, how to, to steer and sort of difficult circumstances, um, veering down, anchoring, towing, every single thing possible. We keep training, 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 and after five years, you, you should start to know everything down to a T, but you forget a lot of things, that's why we keep training all the time. But we do get training with helicopters and such, like, we get training um, to do displays, shows, and everything like that, with the Sea Kings that come over from Creswick, which is great fun. This morning when we launched, um, we went out, sort of did the normal thing, then we went out to the fish farm and did first aid with one of our practice dummies, which is it's good training, different scenarios and things. You make them up and see what's the worst one you can pick out. Hey, we'll take a man over board first. Sandy, you take care. Do the procedure, Marco. Hey, I know. Go on in, Sandy, sorry. Hey, so. Yes. Yeah. We went out, did some man overboard. Um, and a choppy sea is quite good, you know, it gets some, some sort of good training in, good sort of rough weather training. Yeah, good job! Then lifeboat, over. Right, Coast Guard, this is our lifeboat. We're still on exercise in Lamlash Bay, operation is normal. So your crew comes first when you go out in a show or on exercise, you always take care of the crew and the boat and their safety first, so you're always kind of watching out and watching behind you and your eyes are all over the place making sure everybody's all right, so you don't get a chance to think about being seasick or anything. It's not just people who are rescued by the RNLI, it can also be their broken down boats. It'll be my sixth year doing it. So that's quite a long time. As Jeff showed us in the map room earlier, Andrew Craig, Robin and Elsa had drifted this far from the shore. 
in a matter of minutes. Luckily, I'm in good hands today. This is what happened to them next. They were totally out of sight. So we had no idea whether the children were in the boat, whether they'd fallen out. It was just an absolute nightmare. We were absolutely terrified when we were in the boat. And I know we bursted out with tears. And Craig was shivering and scared. I'm going to use the phone, my friends have floated out um, to see from the beach down the road. I'm going to Coast Guard, I'll get you the coordinates to the Back in the boat, six-year-old Andrew, the youngest, was taking control. Andrew was very, very scared, but he never showed his fear. So he was trying to be a little bit brave and prove that he was strong. And he was very strong at that time and he helped everybody by telling them the safety of staying in the boat. I want to get out, I think I can get back to shore. I wanted to jump out because I thought I was strong enough to swim back to shore. Don't jump out of the boat, it's for your own safety. I just told them because it was for their own safety because we couldn't have anything happening for them, could we? Um, for well, practically about seven to ten. Bye, thanks. When they were out in the boat and we were waiting for them basically to be rescued, the thoughts where you just felt so shameful to have let it happen, and um, that. The children were experiencing this awful situation. You didn't know what they were feeling, but you could imagine they were feeling very, very frightened and that you'd let them down. I was a res their responsible parent. I was supposed to be looking after them, take care of them in this world, and I'd let them get into a situation which we had no control of. We saw a helicopter and it kept twirling round. You didn't know what it was doing, so we were all shouting out, that's in SOS. It's coming! The other three um, started calling for it, but I just knew it was um, hovering above us so the lifeboat would know where to come. The crew on board the RAF helicopter decided not to attempt a winch rescue. Taking the children's weight out of the boat might capsize it. Instead, an RNLI lifeboat was on its way from Campbellton to rescue the children. They were all cheekily grinning back at them with little waves. And, you know, it was incredible to think that ourselves, you know, we were pacing up and down the beach, tearing our hair out, not knowing if they were in the water or in the boat. And they were quite enjoying it, watching the helicopter crew. Then a few minutes later, a lifeboat came. They got a rope and told us to catch it which we did, and we had to pull in the rope, and they pulled the other half, so we would come back to the boat. And then they got a little rope ladder so we could climb up, and they took one of us at a time into the lifeboat with big, huge, hairy towels that were itchy. We realised that things were obviously OK, when the helicopter came back over the land and it hovered over the beach above us and we could see that the lifeboat was coming inshore so we realised that there was no need for the helicopter to be out there again. At this point the Coast Guard who had coordinated the rescue arrived on the scene to help take the children from the RNLI launch. As the lifeboat came in with the children on uh, they were wrapped in their blankets and had their juice and chocolate and they landed them on the shore and I, I just didn't know who to hug first. They all, they were all just, I mean, the little smiles on their faces. Um, but they'd obviously not appreciated, I don't think, how, how serious it all had been, but it was, it was a very a sort of moving time. You know, there was lots of hugs all around. My mum was so happy to see me again. I was very happy, but I was a bit frightened that, that my dad might get mad at me. 
happy he was and he was happy that I was safe instead. Andrew was brilliant. He was the youngest boy in the boat. He was six at the time. And he had recently um, had a talk at the school on what to do in the very same situation that they were in and he'd taken all this on board. He'd taken charge of the boat. Andrew put lots of effort into it because if we never had him, we would have been half further out to sea. I thought it was really brave and say if I was out in that boat, I wouldn't have thought about that. I'm very glad what Robert did, what effort he put into helping us, even though he was scared as well. One of the things I would say to anybody that was thinking of letting their children out in the dinghy the same way that we did was to make sure that they had hold of a line on the dinghy, to have it secured in some way, and to also make sure that the children have life jackets on at all times. It's all too easy to get very complacent the same way as we did. We did and we made a mistake. Unfortunately, it worked out OK. And if you do get into the same situation that we get in, you must make sure that the children know what to do, that they're not to get out of the boat and to stay until they get rescued. Thanks to the emergency services and the actions of Robert and Andrew, everyone got back to shore safely. If you want to know more about staying safe around water this summer, then this is for you. You should be very careful around water. Never fall around at the water's edge. Open water is often very cold and deep and may have hidden currents. Take care on the river bank. It may be slippery or it could crumble away. At the seaside, choose a beach with lifeguards. Don't stand in any slippery rocks or banks. Never dive into water unless you know it is at least one and a half metres deep. It is always safer not to dive. If someone is in difficulty in water, you should. Shout help to attract attention. Do not go into the water. Look around you for something that floats to throw to them or a long stick to reach them. Well, I hope you were listening there because it's time for this week's competition. If you fancy winning a pair of walkie-talkies and against all odds goodies, then why not have a go? This week's question is... What should you do if someone falls into water and gets into difficulty? Should you A, shout for help to attract attention, B, run away, or C, dive in after them? If you think you know the answer, then give us a call on 09001 11 That's 09001 11 Please ask permission before you call and dial carefully. Calls cost a maximum of 30 pence and lines close at midnight on Sunday. Good luck. That's it for this week. Join me next week when Against All Odds will be back on dry land. Remember, be safe, not stupid. And if you're ever in any danger, call 999. And whatever the odds, just be careful out there. Until next time, goodbye.